All right. So hi, everyone. We're going to talk about tackling a giant today. But before we get there, I want to take a little detour and talk about the notion of perspective. So if I were to go out and ask all the people in this audience, I suspect most of you would say that you are here trying to advance the state of programming. Right? Let's all make programming better. But without knowing your perspective on the problem, I actually will know effectively nothing about what you're trying to do. Right? You could be looking at it from the standpoint of making better type systems or at making live programming environments like at the live workshop yesterday. Right? And even more fundamental than that, we could all have very different views on what programming even is. So for some people in the audience, programming is probably something along the lines of systems building. For others, maybe it's modeling the world. And for still others, you know, it's the pursuit of executable mathematics and, and elegance, right? <laughs> now, for me, I do, I do believe that certainly we do apply mathematics and we do build systems and then we do model the world. But for me, the fundamental purpose of programming is to augment humans. And I bring this up and I bring up perspective initially because in order for you to understand where I'm coming from in this talk, you have to know that this is how I look at everything. Right? That I believe that all of the things we do in this community um, are in service of trying to make humans more powerful in a sense, more capable. And so our story is going to have three acts as basically every talk and every story does. The first is we have to talk a little bit about what augmenting humans actually means. Like, what is this perspective that by us? And interestingly enough, what does it leave behind? From there, we need a way to evaluate where we are now, to understand how far we've come and how far we have to go. And I think the framework of empathy is a really interesting way of looking at our systems today. And finally, we're going to look at a bunch of domains that are not ours, uh, that many people here may have no experience with whatsoever, uh, to look at tools that have been built already. Right? There's this long, rich history of augmenting humans with tools. And there's a lot for us to learn. And that can teach us a little bit about maybe where we can go. So that's, that's the plan. Let's dive into it. Let's talk about augmenting humans. So our story begins in. 1973 with an issue of Scientific American. And in this issue of Scientific American, there was an article talking about the relative efficiency of uh, locomotion in various animals. And they found that the condor was by far and wide the, the most efficiently moving animal. And about a third of the way down on the list came humans. Not a great showing, but not awful, right? Uh, and this, this article ended up becoming quite famous because one of the editors had the insight to say, well, what about a person on a bicycle? How efficient are they? Well, it turns out a person on a bicycle is significantly more efficient than all the other animals, like huge, huge gap, right? And this became famous because uh, you know, almost a decade later, a young Steve Jobs mentioned this article in an interview. And he coined a wonderful phrase. He said that you know, if you look at the bicycle, it, it fundamentally made people significantly better than they were before. And here we have the computer. And he said, this is the greatest tool ever developed. And it is effectively the bicycle for our mind. I think this is a very visceral way of thinking about this, right? That augmenting humans is like trying to create a thing that makes us so much better than we currently are that we can get places we've never been before. Now, Steve Jobs you know, was obviously famous for various reasons. And so this quote in this interview went around. And many of you probably have seen this interview. Um, but this idea, the idea of augmenting humans, is a much older idea than Steve is. right? Uh, it started with a number of people. But I like to pick Douglas Engelbart here, who's a person I imagine many folks in this audience probably know. So Douglas Engelbart was a computer scientist in the early, early days of computing, right? In the, in the 50s and 60s. And in 1962, he released a report or, or issued a report to the Air Force titled Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And in this, computers hadn't really been developed in any real sense. Like the modern computing didn't exist back then. And in this, he talks about how the purpose of computing is to make us more capable humans. 
that at the end of the day, what we want to do is augment human intellect to create effectively a bicycle for the mind. And he imagined in this, uh, this framework that the purpose of all of this was so that we could solve harder and harder problems, that we could be correct more often, that we as a group of people could better cooperate together and create a better future. And it's a wonderful report. If you ever have the opportunity, it's, it's decently long, but it is very worth reading. It is something that uh, you go back into the 60s and 70s and you, you see a lot of vision, right? And it's sort of a in very interesting thing to go back and look at what we thought computing was going to be and then consider a little bit where we ended up. And so Engelbart released this report in 1962. In 1968, he put his money where his mouth is and built a system that augmented human intellect, as far as he saw it. It was called the NLS. And he did what is now referred to as the mother of all demos. And it is referred to that because it literally lays out all of modern computing. If you have never watched this, you should go watch it. Anybody who works in computing should watch this demo. And then they should ask themselves why it took us 50 years to get to where he was in 1968. He demoed. Uh, real-time video chat, the effectively demoed uh, Google Docs, right, and networked computers, and the ability for multiple people to chat together. Uh, the mouse, everything that we now know as modern computing is in this video. Um, and it's crazy to think that in 1968, we had all of this technology. We had a vision for what computing was supposed to be. It was to augment human intellect. Now, unfortunately, Engelbart did not end up as famous as Steve Jobs, and so we don't talk about him nearly as much as we should. Um, but he did influence a lot of people, some of them that this community would certainly know. For example, a young Alan Kay took a lot of Engelbart's ideas and sort of expanded them a little bit. He said, well, augmenting human intellect is absolutely where we need to be, but there are interesting ways we can think about this. We can think of the computer as a creative medium, as a creative medium as an educational medium, right? That was, that was his focus. This idea that we are going to augment humans, but we're going to do that by sending them out into the world, by giving them devices and systems that allow them to effectively create the mental world in which they operate. And small talk is a beautiful example of this, right? Back then, we had this idea that, that we were going to build a set of systems that fundamentally increased our capacity. And if you dig into this more and more, you start to get the sense, especially back then, that what we were searching for was something like the digital material. Right? We, we think of the system as, as a tool a lot of the time. Computers are this appliance that we just sort of apply to various domains. But thinking about it from this way, from the materials perspective, it gives us this idea that it's something that we shape, that we as users of the system actually contribute to its existence. And this was a big, big thing for, for Alan, right? Where he didn't think that we needed another consumption device. We didn't need another television. What we needed was a new paper, a new steel, something that we can mold and shape in meaningful ways. And so it's you know, 50, 40 years later now. And the digital material has sort of developed, although maybe not exactly the way we thought it was going to. And if you think about what this, what this is for people today, uh, there are effectively only three real interfaces that people know about in the world. They are Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. <laughs> the Microsoft Office suite became the digital material these days, and in some ways for good reason, and others maybe not so good reasons. But if you think about it, it, it gets at something very important, and we're going like, to look at this carefully for a moment. But if you think about it, Word, Word gives us documents. Great. We now have an analog for paper. And that's very useful. And we know paper is a very powerful medium. And having you know, powerful tools to, to do word processing is certainly useful because, and I'll bring this up again later, because we tell stories. Fundamentally, the way we communicate as people is we tell stories. I'm telling you a story right now. And the way we've traditionally dealt with that is through oral communication and then as as we developed a uh, greater sense of literacy right through written communication. And so you look at the Word document, and it runs a lot of the world because we're sitting there telling a bunch of stories. But to tell those stories, we need some way to process data. 
right? We need some way to understand and analyze what we've got in front of us. And Excel is hands down, by orders of magnitude, the most successful programming environment in existence. I know we don't always talk about it that way, but we should. And if you want to get into the rigors of it, it is a functional reactive language, right? There's, there's a set of semantics there. It all makes sense. It may be limited in some sense, but it is programming. And hundreds of millions of people do it, right? There's a lot we can take from this as an example. And it, and it facilitates this idea that at the end of the day, this is, the, this is our, our ability to analyze data in this digital material that we have. It's our ability to organize things. So the vast majority of people, interestingly enough, who use Excel, don't ever write a formula. They just use it to organize information. And finally, a different version of storytelling, right? We have PowerPoint. And so when I write a document, I can distribute it. Nobody usually comes up here and just straight reads a document, although sometimes they do, but that's relatively rare. Most of the time when we're doing uh, one-to-many communication, we want to tell a story through visuals. And PowerPoint became this, this magical piece of software. If you ever watch uh, regular people, the people not in this audience who you know, spend their time thinking about how computers are going to work, use PowerPoint. They use it for almost everything. It is, it is pretty funny. Um, as an example, and this is true of all the Office products, they get used for things that were never developed for. Uh, if you were to ask the average person to modify or crop an image in some way, they're going to open PowerPoint about half the time. They see it as an image editor. They see it as a canvas upon which they can put stuff. Um, and it's amazing to me all of the various things people have done with this, from making Pac-Man in Excel to editing images in PowerPoint. So this is what the digital material became 50 years later. And honestly, it's pretty short of what Engelbart wanted, and it's pretty short of what Kay wanted. But in order to understand maybe why that is, there's, there's a very interesting question you have to start to ask. And this was something we did very early on in EVE was we went around collecting examples of what people would want to do with a computer if they could make it do anything. So imagine you could make the computer literally do anything you want. What would you do? And the answers we got were wide and varied, unsurprisingly. But what did surprise us and was sort of a, a very revelatory moment for us was that almost everything they wanted to do, and this was across the board, whether they were non-programmers, reluctant programmers, or professional programmers, or uh, people pushing the state of the art of programming, they all fell into effectively three actions they were trying to perform. The first was they were trying to collect some information. And most of the time, you can think about this as just automation in some form or fashion. But when we asked, for example, a school teacher, they're like, yes, I just wanted to know everything about my students. Right? I wanted to collect all of this information. Or as, a, as someone running a small business, I wanted to know the exact inventory in my warehouse. Uh, and, and, and even like when we asked startups and stuff, they all fell into this too, amusingly enough. You know, oh, I want to know who's tweeting about my company. Right? All, about, all of this is automating the collection of information. And then once we have that information, the next thing people wanted to do was ask questions about it. This is the full, you can think of analysis in general as simply asking questions. And I think that's a much more powerful way of thinking about it in a lot of ways because it gives you a lot of leverage. But I now know everything about my students. Which ones of my students have missed two homeworks in a row? What parts in my data, or what parts in my warehouse am I less than five of, right? What am I missing? Who, who's talking about us? These are all a set of questions. And I, and I really like this this framing of things. Because if you think about it, for the most part, computers are awful at letting us ask questions. And that's something that, that as a giant group of researchers, I would really implore you to explore. Because I think that there's a massive amount of leverage from us giving people the ability to ask questions. And yeah, we can talk about you know, grandma being able to ask questions. But even ourselves, think about the questions we are capable of asking and getting answers to about our programs. It's a really, really small number of questions we can ask. And almost none of them are the interesting ones. You never get an answer to why is this happening. And the last thing that people wanted to do, so they've, they've collected some information. They've asked some questions about it. Now they need to communicate it. They need to tell that story, right? And this 
took a bunch of interesting forms. And I, again, I think this is an interesting framing on this, right? GUIs and alerts and all of these things are just forms of communicating this information to yourself. So as a teacher, I want an alert when two people, or when a person misses two homeworks in a row, or I want an alert when my warehouse is running empty. Other times, I want to build dashboards for my boss, or I want to build nice little interfaces for us to explore and understand the data, or I just want a PowerPoint or a document, right? These are all ways that we are trying to communicate information to people. And so we kept asking, we collected more and more examples over time, and we've been doing this for a couple of years now, and they really do all fit into this. Everything that we could get people to tell us what they wanted to do with a computer fell into these buckets. They wanted to collect some information, ask some questions, and then communicate the answers. So from there, we have some sense of what people wanted to actually, what people want to do with this bicycle for the mind that we've created, right? That this digital material that we have in front of us. But now we have to ask a, a different question, which is, we obviously do have these three interfaces, and people obviously do use them. They are massively successful. Uh, what more do we have to do? And how well have we done it? And so to do that, we're going to talk about empathy. So we need some way to evaluate it, right? We need some way, some framework to think about these things in. And I think empathy is a particularly interesting one because we're talking about augmenting humans. And when we talk about dealing with humans, we do usually talk about empathy in some form or fashion. And fundamentally, computers as a device completely lack empathy. They are just calculators, more or less, right? And so at some level, it's, it's, it's our job to sort of provide that for them, right? Like if computers don't have empathy, but we're building tools for people, we have to acknowledge that there actually is a person on the other end of this. And people are a little strange, and they make mistakes, and bad things happen. But the computer doesn't know that every time I open this, I am now scared of it, right? That, that I ended up in this state completely accidentally. I have no idea how I got here. Um, and the computer doesn't show you any sympathy for that, right? It's like, well, you did. You told me to do it, so I did it. And I imagine many of the folks in this room, you know, you're your local IT person for your family or your, your friend group or whatever. I, you know, I have actually seen this. This is not an exaggeration. People accidentally manage to get such that their screen is covered in toolbars, right? And that's not, you go to argue here and you say, well, they shouldn't have clicked the buttons. Well, we shouldn't have made the software work that way, right? We should have accepted that humans are on the other side. And we need to acknowledge the fact that, frankly, we don't know what we're doing most of the time, even those of us who supposedly do. But that's just one example, right? And that, yes, it doesn't accept that you know, this makes us nervous. But there are lots of other things where we sort of intentionally design them to be unempathetic. And we have, you know, we, we, I'm going to take this example because I think this is a great one. Because when we talk about computers, we talk about one of these amazing things that we have is the ability to arbitrarily duplicate information for free effectively. And cut, copy, and paste like fundamentally changes your way of thinking about the world. But we also created what is effectively the equivalent of a bag with a hole in it. Every time I put something in the bag, the other thing falls out of it, right? We, we have effectively engineered our computer to have the memory of a goldfish. And for what reason exactly did we do this? Uh, you know, historically, OK, yeah, we really didn't have a lot of memory. Maybe we couldn't do some of these things. But frankly, that doesn't hold water. Didn't hold water for about 30, almost 40 years now, right? There is absolutely the ability for us to have multiple things in a clipboard. Um, but for whatever reason, we didn't. And then finally, we end up in this place where you know, the computer is, is not really working the way we do. It's forcing us to operate in the way it thinks. And it's scaring us half the time. And then you get people who are deathly afraid of making mistakes for a medium whose almost sole purpose right, is to allow us to experiment, to allow us to understand things. And you can't blame them when, for about 20 years, you make a mistake and you can end up here. And this is, to me, is the ultimate show that we weren't thinking about empathy whatsoever. This, this screen just says, you messed up. And then silence. What do you do about it? How do you fix it? You can't. 
And because it had the memory of a goldfish, you just lost all of your work too. It's no wonder that people are kind of scared of these systems. And frankly, it's largely because from the lens of empathy, we didn't make them for people, right? So I picked on computing in general a little bit here. Let's talk about programming. Because programming is, a, is especially egregious here. Um, and I'm going to give a bunch of examples. They are representative examples. I could have picked anything here. I could have picked any language. I could have picked any system. And we will see basically the same things. Right? And so when we talk about programming, we talk about programming languages. And we develop these languages. And they, they have these beautiful semantics like this. <laughs> and we expect people to understand them. We expect people to be able to explore and learn them. and and really get around and build great things with them. But this is opaque. This is not understandable. This doesn't make any sense at all. And again, I'm, I'm using JavaScript here, but I could have put Python. I could have put OCaml. I could pick any language that you use and show very similar sets of things. Right? And so from the get-go, we say, if you want to program, if you want to be able to do this thing, you want to be able to control a computer, here's pick one of these 500-page books and get started. And imagine if, 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 in order to operate inside of the world, the very first thing you had to do was read a physics textbook. Like to pick something up, to pick a cup up, you had to read a physics textbook. Right? Nobody's going to be able to do that. And there are this, it's amazing that this room is as full as it is, that so many people have done this. And that sort of speaks to the promise. right? That speaks to the fact that computers, or at least we see, immense power in them. And we want to explore that and, and understand and use it. Now, fortunately, we actually built into our programming environments and our programming process a little bit of time for you to read one of these 500 page books uh, because the feedback cycle on programming is insanely slow. To give an example here, uh, I used to work on Visual Studio. And to actually build Visual Studio, which no one really did, we had some automated process that did it, uh, it took eight hours. So there are teams working on their own little bits and pieces, and they worked really hard to be able to compile their own little bits and pieces independently. And you wouldn't find out until eight hours later whether or not your thing worked. So you effectively waited a day. And like I said, it gives you time to go read one of those books. But I think Brett Victor said it best when he talked about this, when he said, this is, this is effectively like painting with a blindfold on. We have no idea what's going on half the time. Uh, and when we built Lighttable, one of the major premises of Lighttable was this idea that we could, we could just remove the feedback loop entirely. Get rid of the edit compile debug cycle. Let's just make it so that you instantaneously see what happens. And we found out that it fundamentally changed the way people programmed. They wrote small amounts of code instead of whole pages at once. And it didn't matter whether your, your cycle time was, was 30 seconds instead of eight hours. People still operated fundamentally differently when there was any break in that, in that stream of consciousness, when they were forced to go through a set of steps in order to try something. And so while we're, we're wandering around aimlessly waiting to find out whether or not our thing worked, and we finally get it to compile eight hours later, we get this lovely error message, which is effectively the equivalent of the blue screen of death. right? And again, I'm picking on JavaScript because it's easy to pick on, but it's easy to pick on all the languages here. I could find wonderful stack traces for everything. Um, once again, where's, where's the empathy? Where's the ability to ask questions and get answers about what's actually going on here? right? We, we don't have any of that. Instead, we're forced to intuit everything. We're forced to effectively play the computer ourselves. But let's say you get past all of that. You read your book. You figured out how to read error messages like this. And you're now building software. And you, you go into the wider world of, of software engineering and, and what it means as a practice. And you uh, want to use some other thing. Our uh, ecosystems have become so complicated that you need package managers to install package managers to install package managers. And I don't know, I do a lot of, a lot of work with people who are you know, relatively new to programming and, and you know, are trying to, trying to make cool stuff and don't really know how to get started. Uh, it's impossible. How do you even go and find out 
what library to use anymore. Um, it, it is astounding to me that, that again, that anybody reuses anything at all just because literally you look up, you go to one of these package managers and you say, well, I want to work with images. Okay, here's a thousand libraries, good luck, pick one, right? How do you know what to do? How do you know what correct even is, right? It is, it is a very difficult thing to navigate. And I, as a professional programmer who's been programming for 20 years now, who builds compilers and databases and all this crazy stuff, it took me an hour and a half to get a JavaScript project started. And I program JavaScript every day. So I think to really drill this, uh, or to really bring this point home, I think it's kind of interesting. Imagine a scenario here where the apocalypse happens and unfortunately you come across the only remaining computer, which is of course running OpenBSD, and um, it's booted into a node terminal. Imagine you've never seen node, you've never seen any of this stuff before, and you come to this computer. How would you understand what it does, what it's for, what you can do with it? <laughs> Apparently not get out of it. Oh, hey, some numbers. Yeah, that works. I can do numbers with two digits. I can do some math. Right, if you came upon this, there is literally no way you could ever extract JavaScript from it. There's no way you could ever recover what is inside of this system. At best, you'd probably decide that it's a really bad calculator. <laughs> because math is the only thing that seems to give any feedback and any makes any sense at all, right? And so this might seem contrived, right? Admittedly, designing for the post-apocalypse is not like super high priority. Um, but if you think about it, this is exactly the new user experience. This is no different than someone walking into your tool for the very first time, walking into Node and saying, okay, it's, there's a cursor, help? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna help you, right? There's no empathy inside of these systems. We did not design them to be things that a person can walk up to and use. And like I said, there are historical reasons why that was true, right? The early days, we didn't know what computers were. We didn't have enough computing power to do anything meaningful. But that's not true anymore. We don't have one of these, right? I have the equivalent of like something close to 100,000 of these in my pocket. We can do much, much better than we used to. And part of the reason why we haven't is that we've just kind of forgotten that there are people at the other end of the equation here. And people make mistakes. So computers do lack empathy. But fundamentally, it is our job to provide it for them. Right? Just because they lack empathy doesn't mean that we can't make them have empathy. It doesn't mean we can't build affordances in for them to allow them to approach this and understand it, to approach uh, a brand new tool and be able to shape it and mold it, right? So that's a bit of what we have to do. And like I said, from the lens of empathy, we've got a really long way to go, right? Our tools are, are, are very early in this curve. And so to understand, well, what can we do about it? How could we make it better? Let's talk about a little bit about what we already know. Right? So if you think about it, we've been developing tools for millennia, developing tools for people for millennia. Right? This is not a new domain. As a matter of fact, uh, we're so good at it now that you can go to a single store and buy over 10,000 of these tools. Right? And when you think about it, there are so many domains. There are so many things we've done to make ourselves better, to augment humans. And there is a rich culture, and this is relatively new, right, of, of what it means to design things for people. Uh, but as a practice, we do have it. And so, uh, interesting little bit of history. How many people have ever seen this? One. That's, that's sad. So, this was a tool developed in, uh, I think it was the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, by Henry Dreyfus Associates. Uh, and it is called human scale. 
And at the time, uh, or for, for what it's worth, for those who don't know, Henry Dreyfus was one of the early, early product design firms. So they designed the, uh, the, the original telephone for, for Bell, all the way back there, all the way up to some modern things. And uh, at the time, nobody really knew much about ergonomics, right? That's what we call the, the sort of study of how humans are functioning and how they can use things and how they sit in a chair in this particular instance. And these folks at Henry Dreyfus pulled all of this information together from all of these different domains, did a bunch of original research, and created a set of these cards. I think there's like seven or eight of them. Uh, and they have this little slider on the side, you can see over on the right hand there. And all of those numbers in white, they change as you slide the slide. And the slider does things like, well, how old are you? How tall are you? Right? This is a whole set of measurements to understand exactly how people work. Exactly what they look like when they sit in a chair. How, how tall are they in a chair? What level of incline can they reasonably comfortably be at? And they have this for everything. They have this for your ability, your relative strength of moving like this, right? Everything, because at the end of the day, they were developing products for people to use. And more recently, actually, it's, it's really great. Uh, some folks uh, built a Kickstarter, or started a Kickstarter to bring these back, to reprint them. Uh, and they had a really great quote when they released it. They said, you know, you can design anything in a vacuum. But if you're not considering the people who are going to use it, they're not going to have a great experience. And there are lots of, of examples that we could use historically, and there are lots of examples in modern day of, of people designing things and not really thinking it through. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk about too many of them. They tend to be pretty obvious when you see them. Uh, <laughs> but it's a big world out there. And all the things we've done certainly haven't been failures, right? There are lots of big successes. Um, and there are some big successes in programming tools even as well. But I want to talk more about things that we don't usually talk about. I want to talk about domains that you know, most of the time you would expect to be in an entirely different conference. For example, woodworking. So we're going to start out with a couple of physical tools because I think they're particularly interesting and there's a lot we can learn from them and we tend to ignore them in general. But woodworking is a particularly, a particularly great one. Uh, and one of the fundamental things about woodworking that's different than the, than the programming tools I've shown is that when you're working with wood, you are shaping material. That notion of material is coming back to us again, right? If we had a digital material, a thing that we could shape, as opposed to just coming to something and then putting atoms together and ta-da, we created something out of nothing. Like, there's a much more natural way of thinking about the world where instead you start with something and you shape it. Now, there's no reason why our, our programming environments couldn't work this way. As a matter of fact, some much older ones did. And you could imagine an environment where you are shaping material, where you, you have access to a set of pieces of wood, if you will, and you're putting them out onto the canvas, and you're sitting there and directly working with them, directly manipulating them. In this particular case, I'm saying that I want a little ball, and its radius is proportional to its x. This is working with material directly, right? This is spitting something out on the canvas, immediately seeing something, and then shaping it to be the way we want. Another really great thing about uh, woodworking, and this, this was something I learned actually at a conference, a closure conference years ago, is that literally everything in woodworking, every woodworking tool basically resolves down to a wedge. Which is a really interesting thing. So a chisel, wedge. Block plane, wedge. Saw blade, a bunch of wedges in a row, right? And that's really, that's really powerful. And this is an idea that we do have in, the, uh, in, in programming, right? Everything is a wedge, and wedges are really simple. They are the simplest possible thing. At least that's what we were told in, in elementary school, right? They are one of the simple machines. Uh, and so you have this very small set of composable tools, right? And that's a very powerful idea. Uh, it's a very powerful and it's a very old idea in programming, right? This is Lisp. This is small talk. This idea that you have a very small set of primitives and you can build very powerful things out of them if you very, very carefully design them. 
But the trend lately in programming languages and in programming design in general is to more and more complex things. So if you look at JavaScript, again as an example, it started out as a relatively simple, if not super well designed language, uh, and has since become insanely complicated. And now we're trying to add decorators and everything else to it, right? We're growing the book so that it's you know, a good thousand pages now instead of 500 like it was before. Um, <laughs> Funny, funny story. At one point in time, uh, when I was at Microsoft, I, I went around uh, speaking because I, I used to own the experience of using C Sharp and Visual Basic. And uh, they asked me to speak about new language features at this conference. I was like, well, that's not really my area, but sure, I'll talk about it. And I realized trying to make this thing that one of the, one of the big things that was on the new language features for C Sharp 4.0 was co and contravariance. And I tried desperately to explain that to people, you know, working programmers, and they just kind of eyes glazed over. And I decided at that moment that any time that your language relies on explaining co and contravariance, you've already lost. And so we might as well just move on and start talking about cool IDE stuff. <laughs> but a small composable set of tools has a lot of leverage. It gives you a lot of power. Now another interesting thing is if you do have this small composable set of tools that are well designed, uh, in woodworking, you see this a lot. You can make your own little tools. So if you go to a professional woodworker shop, you will see jigs everywhere because it's the same material. The way I make a jig is the same way I make anything else in woodworking. I take a saw to it. I take a plane to it, right? I manipulate a piece of wood, and now all of a sudden I have a tool that allows me to do things much more efficiently. Now, ostensibly, we could make our own tools, but we relatively rarely do because the cost in programming is extraordinarily high. Just trying to get information about the system that you're working with to ask a question is very, very difficult, much less than trying to communicate that information in some meaningful way. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. We could have some sort of medium that allows us to make tools very easily. And so I have a nice little bouncing ball simulation here. And don't worry too much about what I'm doing, but basically what I want to do is I want to understand exactly how my y velocity is changing over time. And so what I can do is create a little text thing down here and say, well, the text is whatever the current y velocity is, and you know what, I'm going to put it where the ball is at that point in time. And well, I only got one of them because I only told it that I wanted one of them, but if I add a little timer here, I can now make it uh, create this little trail of y velocities behind myself. And it's, you know, once a second isn't super useful. We can adjust that resolution and all of a sudden, I now have a very visual and useful way of looking at my y velocity. I built a tool. I built a tool in 30 seconds. That's how long that video was, right? Now, that tool may only be useful for four or five minutes. So if it took us 30 minutes to make it, it's obviously not useful anymore. But if we can drop that cycle time down to near nothing, time down to effectively as fast as you can think of the thing, then all of a sudden this becomes a lot more powerful. Now this is a, maybe not a super interesting example, but imagine you could do this for anything, that you could visualize and understand and build jigs for all, of your, all the aspects of your program in 30 seconds. That starts to be pretty compelling. So woodworking is a great example, uh, and we could keep digging into that, but I want to go some other places. Uh, I want to go to another physical example, though, and that is cooking. So cooking is another one of these cases where you're working very directly, very concretely with what's in front of you, right? You're shaping some material. And uh, I, I like cooking because it, it's, it's a funny example. Uh, it's an example that we tend to bring up a lot in programming world uh, because of the recipe, right? This is used as sort of an existence proof that imperative programming is natural to people. Um, and if you've ever watched somebody who's not a great cook use a recipe, you know that that's not really true. Um, but, and, and not only is it not really true, it's not true even in principle. Um, so if you think about it, I, and I, this one kind of drives me a little bit crazy because people use this all the time when, when the imperative, declarative, you know, 
nonsense comes up, everyone's like, but how would you make a sandwich? Right? That's, that's the fundamental example that we have to talk about. How do you make a sandwich? And they're like, that is obviously an imperative thing. And I'm going to let Carl Sagan make my argument for me here, which is that if you want to make a pie from, an apple pie from scratch, you first have to invent the universe. If it's really imperative, then you better be telling me how you went from atoms to bread, how the bread got to the store, how you went to the store to get the bread, how the bread ended up in your house. Right? No, we don't actually do things as purely imperative things. We don't talk about making sandwiches purely imperatively. There's a lot of declarativity in all of our communication, in all of the ways we think. And so our systems should be both imperative and declarative. There are times when it is much more natural to just say, you know what, the, the radius of this thing is you know, half its height or whatever. Right? And other times you want to just say, hey, when I click a button, I want to add one to a counter. Right? There are times when we want to be able to do both. And so we should have programming semantics and environments that allow us to leverage the best way of thinking about a problem when we're doing it. And so in this example, I am building exactly that little thing I said. I'm going to create a button and say, when I click it, I want to set the count to count plus one. And you know what? I want to set uh, the text of the button to be size colon that count. Right? So there's a, there's a mix of imperative and declarative steps here. And I can click on it, and it's very small, but it's actually up to six now. And sort of really drilling this point home that we should be able to intermix these however we want. Right now I have a ball, again, a little circle, and I'm going to say its radius is based on the count of this thing. And I don't have to describe the steps necessary to replace that number or to, just to, to say how to change the radius. I just say the radius is. Right? I make a declarative statement that is working with a bunch of imperative things. And that's a very powerful way of working. And so I think instead of talking about, well, is it imperative or is it declarative, we should start talking about how is it both? How can we bridge this gap between the two? How can we treat it as a spectrum instead of uh, points in a space? Another great thing uh, about cooking is this notion that I can adapt it to my will. Right, so if I have a guacamole recipe, I personally think that or I have that genetic mutation that makes cilantro taste like soap. So I don't tend to put cilantro in things, so I'm not going to. Right? I'm just not going to do that. I can change a recipe. I can make it into something else. Right? I can take the good parts uh, and use something that somebody else has done, but make it my own. And if you think about doing this in, in, our, in our tools, right? we have libraries as our form of reuse. But I can't really change the library. Somebody has to have built in all of the ways I can manipulate it. And that's kind of unfortunate, because unlike in, in cooking, uh, I don't get the chance to remix something. Right? I made this is sort of the, the, the holy grail of cooking once you have kids, is that you make one thing and you keep reusing it over and over again as different things throughout the rest of the week. Right? So you know, I made barbecue chicken. Great, tomorrow's going to be barbecue chicken quesadillas, right? And then we're going to have some sort of barbecue chicken casserole. I can remix a thing. I can take something and repurpose it in a useful way. And I'm going to use an example here, historically, of the one tool that I can think of that we developed that is amazingly good at this, that unfortunately we don't use anymore. And that's HyperCard. So when you got a HyperCard stack from somebody, it was literally a toolkit that you could use to build other HyperCard stacks. You could take something out of it and use it. You're like, this is a really cool button. I'm going to take this button. I'm going to use it over here. Right? Every single thing that was passed around was a new set of tools, a new set of pieces that you could remix. And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And a big difference, it may seem subtle at first, but the actual implications of this difference from the way we think about uh, reuse in software are huge. Right? This means that I can take something and instantly reuse it. I don't have to really think much about how to do that. So I can take this pulsing ball and you know what? I'm going to change it now. Make it bigger. I'm going to change its color next. Right? These are things that I can do without having to design for reuse, without having to be sort of an architectural master, which honestly we're pretty bad at abstraction uh, despite what we may think. And so, Having tools that allow us to just more directly 
manipulate things, reuse them in the same way that we do that with physical tools is very powerful. Okay. So we talked a lot about physical stuff. Let's talk about a couple of digital examples. And I think a good one here is Photoshop. So Photoshop's a great example, and the reason why is it has a lot of the properties that woodworking does, or that cooking does, right? For example, it is very direct and concrete. The thing that I am making is always on the screen. I am shaping material. I am not sitting there creating something from complete nothingness unless I choose to do so, right? I can take an image and manipulate it. This notion of being direct and concrete is something that actually was coming up a lot in the live programming workshop yesterday. And I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is that in order to make things uh, more palatable, to make them more understandable, to shorten that feedback loop, you kind of have to make them direct. Right? You can't go through a bunch of steps to understand something. You have to be able to manipulate it directly and see the effect of it. You have to make things concrete as much as possible. And so a great example of this uh, that, that sort of is a counter example to the general computing thing, getting rid of that, that uh, goldfish brain for a moment, Photoshop has a history panel. And this is something I don't understand why our, gen our systems generally don't have. This has nothing to do with programming anymore. It's like taking a step back for a moment. We should always have this. Because not only is it much, much more powerful than undo, even though it may not look like it at first, but it helps do something that I mentioned before. It helps show empathy. I don't have to remember all of the steps I have taken to get to where I am right now. And if I make a mistake, it shows up in the list and it shows me what I did, right? Let's say I accidentally do something and it's totally awesome. I accidentally applied some filter. I can see you applied this filter, right? Whereas in our systems right now, in general, I can see I did it and I can undo it, but I can't do anything else, right? There's no feedback whatsoever. There's no history. There's no breadcrumb trail for you to follow. And this is something that, like I said, we should be building into computers as a general thing. If right now, they effectively have infinite amounts of space. We could keep this for all of time for everything you've ever done, and it would probably be totally fine. And the leverage that gives us is pretty incredible. If for no other reason, then it helps reduce the fear of making mistakes, right? When, you're, when you make a mistake in a programming language and the only thing you get is you failed, that starts to hurt at some level, right? That starts to feel bad. You get mad at the compiler. You feel like you're fighting. Um, whereas we could make mistakes effectively free. Another thing that Photoshop does really well is that it accepts that there's like an outside world and that I can take some asset in the outside world and put it into mine, into whatever I'm working on, instantly, without any ceremony. And if you compare this to what you have to do in your programming environment to, say, get a sound inside of it, uh, it's pretty incredible, right? There's so much you're going to have to do. And chances are you don't know how to do it, so you're going to spend probably an hour and a half, two hours, just looking at documentation, trying to figure out how to load a sound. But there's no reason why we couldn't have developed the environment such that it was built to allow things to come into it to make it so that I can just drag and drop a sound and immediately start to work with it. Unfortunately, I didn't, have, I didn't hook up the sound itself, but it's playing some song here. And you know, I'm going to create a little ball and then make the ball move. It's not just a matter of being able to bring an asset into your system. It's about being able to meaningfully use that asset, to treat it as another extension of the material. right? And then being able to extend it means that all of a sudden, your world is full of new tools to play with, full of new avenues to explore. So in this case, like I said, make the, we're going to make the ball dance based on the amplitude of the sample at the time. Just like that. Once again, that video was 45 seconds. Right? We can do way, way better than we currently do. I guarantee you that if I asked a professional programmer to try and build that little thing, it'd take them a couple hours. As a matter of fact, one of the examples we used to harp on, because it's, it's particularly funny, we tried to figure out what's the simplest possible GUI program you could imagine a real person building. And we came up with that button that I showed before, more or less. A button that counts the number of times it's been clicked. 
You can imagine you're the guy sitting at the front of, you know, the bouncer or whatever, sitting at the front of some club, and you're counting the number of people coming into the, into the thing. And my, uh, we went around and we actually had professional programmers try and build this, and the results were hilarious. Um, my, one of the guys who used to work with us, one of our colleagues, uh, is an Oxford trained, uh, Oxford and Cambridge trained mathematician and computer scientist. He's been programming professionally for almost a decade. It took him 30 minutes. I did it in approximately 13 seconds in this environment, right? Uh, we can do a lot better. So Photoshop is an interesting one in the sense that, like I said, it talks about being able to, and there, there are lots more things that I'm glossing over in the interest of both time and your sanity. Um, but I want to go someplace that I think is particularly interesting. And I actually did an entire talk about this at the Berkeley Institute of Design uh, earlier this year. And I'm only going to use one example here. And I think games are a really interesting place to look for inspiration. Specifically, I think Minecraft is brilliant. Uh, and there's been a lot of study about how Minecraft relates to people interacting with computers and how Minecraft relates to programming. But once again, I'm going to hammer home this idea that it is direct and concrete, right? That every action I can perform is obvious to me in Minecraft. I can go around and I can mine some blocks and I can you know, carve out my little place and then I can place some blocks and build a house. I am directly manipulating the world. And there's a really important idea that comes from the game design world, this notion of conveyance. And this is the idea that in order to make a game feel good, in order to make it fun to play, what you have to do is convey the user into the world. Right? So if you think about this uh, in terms of that Node.js REPL I showed before, you are not conveyed in any way, shape, or form into the world of JavaScript. Right? You are simply thrown into the pool and you're drowning most of the time. Whereas in something like Minecraft, the rules of the world can be explored. I can find out how it works just by moving around, just by pressing buttons and exploring what I can do, exploring what can happen. And I can understand effectively the entire game simply because I was placed in the world as an actual actor inside of it. And conveyance is a really interesting thing, and there's actually a good example of this in a programming environment, my definition of programming at least, right? Excel actually does a pretty good job of conveying you into a world of 2D grids. Everything you can do, for the most part, you know, yeah, you can do more advanced things, but the core of it is something that you could just accidentally stumble upon, right? You can accidentally write programs in Excel without ever knowing you did it. And every action you take has value. Right? You compare that to writing a Python script where effectively until you're completely finished, the script has literally no value. Whereas in Excel, the moment I have typed a number into a cell, I'm immediately getting something out of it, right? I'm conveyed into that world and it's something that I can explore. So another thing uh, that comes from games is, is referencing the, the goldfish brain again. Why don't we have inventories? Why don't we have this idea that like, instead of thinking about the clipboard as this little ephemeral thing that I, you know, I put stuff in and immediately stuff falls out of it, why can't I just have a place where, hey, this is a really interesting color, this is a really interesting image, this is a really interesting whatever, right? And place it in my inventory, place it in my backpack, so that when I'm carrying things around, you know, when I'm going across different programs or different tasks or whatever, these are all now tools that I have in my backpack, right? They're tools that I have that I can uh, pull out and use at any point in time and do really interesting things with. And when I've said this before, some people are like, well, that's what a file system is. And no, not really. Right? I can't take a color, whatever that means. Let's say I'm in Photoshop and I literally copy, I, I say copy on a swatch of color. Right? If, if I were to put that into the file system, I've created another thing. It's not a color, it's now a file that has some information that is kind of like a color. Right? And how do I use that somewhere else? How do I go into, into, into PowerPoint, for example, and make my my circle on the screen that color. Well, I can't drag and drop the file on it, right? It's something else. It became something different. And so we should absolutely have this notion of an inventory across all of our programs. Um, but it would be particularly useful in our programming context, where we can think of reuse, again, as this form of remixing, 
Well, I go into the universe, grab a bunch of things, grab a bunch of ingredients, throw them out onto my canvas, and all of a sudden I've got a whole thing, you know, a whole bunch of stuff to start building my program with. And Minecraft, like I said, is, is amazing. A hundred million people have bought Minecraft. And they've done just ridiculous things with it. This is a 16-bit computer um, that somebody built, right? And they've, they've rebuilt famous scenes from movies and their own fictional world. And what's amazing to me is they did this purely through exploration. They didn't sit down and think up a bunch of commands. They didn't sit down and write a recipe. They sat down, they explored the world, they shaped a bunch of material. And when you build an environment that is designed to let you explore, to, to feel safe, to feel free to just try things out and see what happens, where feedback is immediate, where everything you do is direct and concrete, or at least as direct and concrete as you could imagine. All of a sudden you can do all sorts of interesting things because you have a bag of tricks to play with. And so in this particular example, I've got this little bouncing ball thing that we built that has a little tail, and I just hooked it up to dance to the music. So it's, it's X velocity is dependent on the amplitude of the song. And so as the song starts to pick up, you see it starts dancing around, right? Again, that was about 45 seconds. We can do all sorts of amazing things if we give people the ability to explore their environments. And if we really take to heart the fact that, hey, we actually know how to build tools for people. We've been doing it for a long time. So to wrap up, I said we were tackling a giant. I think we're tackling the giant. Right? I think we're looking at the perspective, or looking at it from the perspective that our goal here, our job as people pushing the state of programming is to do what Engelbart said back in 62. It's to augment humans. Right? That at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with computers is not make more programming languages or make more computers even. It's to get something done. My co-founder, when, when we started this company, he's a cell biologist. I don't care about me. I want him to be better. And the reason why I want him to be better is because he's literally trying to heal me faster. Right? When I get hurt, he's the one I want to have power, not me. That's the way we should be looking at the world. But in order to do that, we have to really accept the way that people are trying to use computers, right? We have to really accept that when we talk about what a person is going to do, is that most of the time, all they're trying to do is collect some information, ask some questions, and then tell a story, right? And we have this rich history of how to build tools for people, how to augment humans in meaningful ways. And that comes down to us accepting the fact that people aren't perfect, that we need to show empathy, right? That we go through fear and uncertainty when we work in an environment that doesn't behave the way we want it to or doesn't do the things we had hoped. That honestly, even the best of us don't know what we're trying to do most of the time, right? We, we don't at the outset know exactly what the end result is going to be. We have to explore to get there. We have to understand the system as we build it. It needs to be like Minecraft, right? But if we do that, if we remember that programming is just a means to an end, if we remember that behind all of our work, no matter what our work is in this room, there are people. At some point in time, that type system, that theory you're developing is going to help someone if we're lucky, right? If we keep that in mind, then maybe we can build that digital material. And hopefully, finally, maybe everyone can take a ride. Thank you. <laughs>